I feel like sometimes it's really boring to attend lectures where they just go through drug considerations. And I know at the end of the day, a lot of us want to know, okay, if I have this patient come in, what's safe to give it or what's the best choice to give it. And obviously that decision is dependent on a lot of factors, but I think it's helpful. Um, obviously I use the same drugs every day, so I, I know them in and out, but if you're not using the drugs, every day, you might not be as comfortable just selecting from a list uh, of medications. Um, and you might not know what to anticipate if you use a particular drug. So I think case-based association is probably the easiest way to learn pharmacology because otherwise it's tremendously boring in my opinion, um, unless you really like that, uh, which, is, which is not something that I would say I'm really fond of memorization pharmacology. So today we're gonna to work through a variety of cases. I have cases where there's a hit by car. So this could include patients that have head trauma, chest trauma, uh, abdominal trauma or fractures. So just you know, skin uh, and bone involvement. We're gonna talk about wounds and lacerations, which kind of goes hand in hand with some hit by cars or being drug sort of situations. Um, we're gonna talk about respiratory distress because I think in the ER you see quite a few patients that come in uh, for respiratory distress is either a primary or secondary disease. And with the context of that, the case that we're going to talk about um, needs an airway exam. So we you know we need to sedate this patient sufficiently to allow the mouth to open and uh, the doctor to visualize aspects of the mouth, airway, and uh, movement of those aspects. So uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to go through a blocked cat. We're going to do a nucleation. Uh, we're going to talk about some fractious cats and dogs, what I would use in healthy versus sick, uh, just to, to sedate maybe for an IV catheter or ultrasound or uh, radiographs. And then finally, if we have time, um, I, th I threw in abdominal pain there just as a generic uh, case thing, it, pancreatitis being an example and some options for uh, sedation, analgesia, or anesthesia. So first up, if we could get this to cooperate. There we go. So hit by car is a pretty all-inclusive uh, cate categorical case example. So we need to kind of like narrow in where are the concerns. If somebody came up to me and said, hey, I had a hit by car, um, I need to sedate it for radiographs. I'd be like, whoa, I, gotta get, I have to have more information than that. I need to know, you know, do we have evidence of head trauma? And we're going to go through and talk about where my concerns are with that. Um, do we have trauma to the chest? not just the lungs, but the heart as well. So everything within the chest. Do we have abdominal trauma to these major organs? Probably if it was hit by a car, but you know, is there a laceration or a tor splenic torsion or um, mesenteric torsion or something that is causing extreme abdominal pain? Is there abdominal fluid, um, you know, blood in the abdomen, things like that. And then of course, fractures and wounds, which are pretty obvious we can see. So when I'm worried about head trauma, I particularly worry about increased intracranial pressure. And you're probably like, man, that dog looks pretty <clears throat> interesting there. If you notice the pupils, uh, they're different sizes. So this dog has a nisocoria, which is a tall tale sign of, of a head trauma or a ketamine abuser. Humans tend to get a nisocoria. Um, I actually get nisocoria when I'm really tired or have a severe headache, but I'm not a ketamine user personally. I think there are better drugs, but um, <clears throat> This dog, you know, if it was a hit by car and I saw this, it's a really quick way. Um, if I'm being asked to give a sedation suggestion for a hit by car, I can just quickly look uh, to see if they have pupil reflexes to light and if the pupils are the same size. Um, and if they're the same size and they have reflexes, I can't rule out that there's no head trauma, but this is a tall tale sign that there is head trauma. And then my concerns for increasing intracranial pressure uh, become higher on the list and would, would result in me avoiding some drugs. So things that increase intracranial pressure that I like to keep my mind wrapped around, ultimately anything that changes what we call C CPP, so cerebral perfusion pressure. If there's an increase in blood flow to the brain, so cerebral perfusion, then intracranial pressure, ICP, goes linear with that. So if there's an increase in cerebral perfusion pressure, ICP is going up too. So things that, um, that can cause some changes to cerebral perfusion pressure will influence intracranial pressure. So I avoid, you know, really choking these dogs out. Obviously that's not advised anyways, we're a peer-friendly, uh, fear-free clinic, but um, 
but really pay attention to how you're restraining those patients on, and paying attention to that jug, jugular obstruction or even just walking them on a leash if they're a little reluctant to want to come in. Um, really pulling on that leash. So I'm really thinking about jugular uh, occlusion and, and obstruction in some of these hit by car uh, head trauma cases. I want to try to, I, I want to try avoiding using medications that cause vomiting and retching. And so obviously we have some medications that we can give that mitigate vomit, vomiting and retching. So something like meropitin or the, the trade name is Serenium. But I definitely want to try to avoid some drugs and we'll, we'll go through that uh, and what drugs those are as well. Um, I want to avoid vasodilation. So if I cause massive vasodilation, I think of it, this worked well when I lived in Louisiana, we had an interstate that was absolutely terrible and it was one of the only bridges that got over the Mississippi River and they went down to two lanes. <laughs> like two interstates merge and you take us down to two lanes to get over a bridge. Um, so if we cause vasodilation, more blood can go to the brain. So if you add lanes to an interstate, more cars can make it through. We don't wanna cause a lot of vasodilation because as we send more blood to the brain, we increase cerebral perfusion pressure and end up ultimately with an increased intracranial pressure, which is what we're trying to avoid in patients that have had head trauma. So avoiding excessive vasodilation, uh, in line with that, when we knock a patient out, so we sedate them or anesthetize them, usually we slow down their respiratory rate. And as CO2, so carbon dioxide, accumulates in the body because it can't be expired as readily, that causes a, vas a reduction in vascular resistance. So it results in vasodilation and bam, we got an increase in cerebral perfusion pressure and potentially an increase in ICP. So again, uh, we want to try to manage um, our carbon dioxide. We don't want to cause severe respiratory depression. Um, and again, we also would want to avoid hypoxemia. I'm gonna make sure this chat, I'm assuming Mariah's in the background looking at some of that, but um, if people send me messages, I'd like to try to answer them as we're talking about cases. So Mariah, just feel comfortable if you see something come through interrupting and we'll stop and address them as we go, um, unless you think the question's better addressed at the end, but feel free to interrupt me at any time. Hopefully Mariah's there paying attention. Got you. There she is. Okay, thank you. So these are some things that when I have a patient with head trauma, I really try to focus on um, that I can control. So I can, for the most part, control avoid, an avoidance of vomiting uh, with the drugs I have at my hospital. Um, I can try to mitigate changes in vasodilation so I can reduce my inhalant concentration as much as possible. Um, I can ventilate a patient so I can intubate and ventilate them to avoid that increasing carbon dioxide, so hypercapnia, hypercarbia. Um, and then of course, I can put them on 100% oxygen or give flow by oxygen to try to avoid hypoxemia, so low oxygen blood content. So specifically, drugs that I think about um, avoiding if I have a patient with head trauma or concerns for intracranial pressure. Some of these seizing dogs, I would fall into this category as well, but in the context of uh, making a patient, I mean, I realize ER see a lot of seizing patients, um, but hit by cars that you might have to sedate or anesthetize, and you are concerned about head trauma. These are some drugs that I try to avoid when possible. And so hopefully you can see those pretty well. Uh, ketamine really the teletamine in there. Uh, I don't care if you're using telazole or zolotil, the generic, but um, uh, there's another generic telazole, basically. But any of those um, are going to cause indirect sympathetic stimulation and could result in an increase in intracranial pressure. Now, we could argue all day, maybe you don't see that if you give it with a really high dose of a benzodiazepine. But at the end of the day, I think we have better options. Um, so I'm going to avoid I'm going to avoid those two medications um, for anesthesia as, as far as, or, or sedation if, if possible. Dexmedetomidine, I'm probably, and, and specifically the reason why I have a cat there looking so lovely, um, is that alpha 2s are the number one antiemetic. Xylosine particularly uh, causes about causes about 90 percent of cats to vomit when it when it receives xylosine. It does cause an increase in blood pressure secondary to um, and then causes secondary uh, bradycardia, so reflex bradycardia. Um, I would use dexmedetomidine 
in a hit by car at low doses. But the reason I put it up here is in cats, I really don't want to cause vomiting. So I wouldn't use it alone in a dog hit by car and I wouldn't use it um, at high doses. I, I, if I needed it, I'd use it, but at low doses in cats, I would probably consider avoiding just because I really don't want them to vomit or use something that really will help prevent vomiting uh, before the administration of the alpha two. So just keep in mind that's pretty unique to cats. Dogs won't vomit as frequently on alpha twos, but they, there is a small percentage that will, but I'm really trying to avoid that vomiting. Uh, and then of course we have some opioids, depending on the route of administration, that uh, can really contribute to a higher risk of vomiting. So morphine and hydromorphone given intramuscularly, um, high risk of vomiting. People think, well, I'll just give a low dose and the risk will be less. That's not how that works. Low doses actually induce a higher risk of vomiting. So um, it has to do with uh, their, um, their uh, saturation on the, the receptors and where it targets the brain to cause that. So um, it's counterintuitive to be like, well, I have morphine, um, I'm gonna give a low dose. If you have something else, it's probably a better choice. Giving those medications intravenously does reduce the risk of vomiting. You just have to give morphine pretty slow IV. There's a risk of histamine release. So if I have any other opioid, potent opioids that this patient can receive, so full agonist opioid if they're painful, um, I would probably choose that over uh, these two medications. I would give hydro IV. Um, I'd probably give Serenia. Uh, well, I, I give serenia to everything if I'm not told I can't. So um, it would definitely have serenia. Just keep in mind that if you're giving serenia sub-Q, that's going to take an hour to onset roughly, 30 minutes to an hour. Um, so I actually give serenia quite frequently intravenously, uh, slow over a couple minutes. Um, those that work with me are laughing because they know my slow is never over a couple minutes, but ideally slow. It can cause some hypotension. So that's, that's for the brain. Um, when we think of the chest, we're thinking of all the things the chest is, is, um, is responsible for. And if there's trauma to the chest, I, I think of things kind of categorically in two, two groups. I think of space occupying. So something's there that shouldn't be, whether that's tissue, fluid, or air. So a diaphragmatic hernia is, is an example of a tissue space occupying disease in that chest and could cause some difficulty breathing. So if I need to sedate that patient, I'm probably going to complicate, I'm going to probably cause some respiratory depression and I need to be prepared to support that. Um, obviously the next radiograph over is a pneumothorax, so I'm never too scared to stick a needle in it um, and I probably would just to see if I'm dealing with fluid or air and there's air where it's not supposed to be in that chest probably leading to some um, hypoventilation some issues. And then on the other end of things, I really do get concerned with hit by cars about pulmonary contusions. And that's just a fancy word for saying uh, there's bruising. And if I'm going to be giving that patient some breath, so I intubate them and I put them on an anesthetic machine and I squeeze that reservoir bag, if they're hit by car with chest trauma, so I really encourage radiographs, I, um, I get concerned that I might disrupt some of the sensitive tissue in the chest, so some of those contusions or bruises, and result in a space occupying pneumothorax. Um, so you have to be very gentle when you're ventilating some of these guys, and radiographs are really key to knowing where you're at. Obviously, the lungs are responsible for getting rid of carbon dioxide, as well as allowing um, oxygen to have access to the capillary beds and the alveoli so that they um, oxygenate the body. So it's important that we uh, are gentle with those lungs and, and make sure they're doing their job. Uh, other things, thoracic and abdominal trauma, is that you can see VPCs quite frequently in, in, these, in these patients. Um, and that's just an ECG of something that came in that had some cute little uh, VPCs and whatnot. So I thought I'd throw it up there for you. Um, cats or dogs can have this. We tend to see VPCs quite frequently um, in trauma in patients that are in pain and patients that are hypoxic. Uh, if the heart was traumatized, uh, got beat around a little bit in the chest, maybe it was a direct hit to the chest, um, you can see some of this. You know, lidocaine's nice. I'll use it. I'll use it in cats. I'll use it in dogs um, for arrhythmias. Um, and it does have some analgesic properties. Uh, 
cats tend to be a little more sensitive to the toxic effects that their threshold for toxicity is lower than that of dogs so i use it cautiously in cats and i kind of I, I treat it in such a way where I'll give a bolus, maybe two boluses. By the time I'm reaching for a third bolus, I'm thinking maybe there's something else I should be doing. If I'm having to give a second bolus, I'm probably making a plan to, to put on a constant rate infusion, or I'm gonna abort to something a little more potent if I'm dealing with some cardiac arrhythmias. Um, under anesthesia, if the patient needs to go to surgery and it's having some ventricular arrhythmias and we're going into the abdomen, um, or even the chest for that matter, I think lidocaine CRIs can help augment some analgesia. And I have some doses there for you. I don't wanna to get too long-winded on the first case because we won't get through the rest. So some wounds, you know, I think, and we're gonna talk about lo local regional analgesia in this is like one of the pillars, if you can think of, I read that book, The Pillars of the Earth. It's a historical fiction book, but I really like it. It's like the pillars of analgesia. And I have a little I, you know, thing built in here for you to see, but if I'm dealing with a wound or fracture, I have an outline here of basically an anatomical location and a local regional technique I would strongly consider using. If I can block it, that blocks that pain signal from wherever that pain is happening from the brain. Like I can block out, think of women having babies with C-sections and good epidurals. Like they're ripping their abdomens open, technically their uterus, through their abdomen and pulling infants out of them. It's disgusting and crazy all at the same time. And those people aren't feeling a thing. So this is amazing. If we can implement local regional technique in every one of our painful procedures, I, I feel we should be doing so. Um, and so these are some suggestions there for you. And I'm happy to share any of these slides uh, at any time if, if you'd like to know. Obviously, some of it's shorthanded. Um, so what would I give? If I had all the drugs in the world, what would I do for a hit by car to sedate it? Um, and then plus or minus induce it for a procedure? Uh, keeping in mind, sedation isn't always safer than anesthesia. Uh, it's really about monitoring your patient and understanding if you, um, if you have the ability to provide respiratory support uh, with oxygen and ventilation um, and of obviously IV access. So my drugs of choice would be methadone. That's that vial on the far left for you. Uh, if I don't have methadone, uh, methadone is a nice long lasting drug, doesn't generally cause vomiting, can at higher doses roughly. So you can see it more commonly in cats, but it's very, very rare to cause vomiting. Um, longer duration so I can give them one hit of it and get a, some analgesia on board. Or if I feel like the patient's painful and I have the ability to do a constant rate infusion, I do go to fentanyl. It can cause some nausea, but you generally don't see vomiting with it. Um, not saying you can't, but you generally don't. I would give it serenia before either of those medications. Um, and then sedation, if needed, hit by cars, I tend to gravitate more towards dexmedetomidine than acepromazine. One, it's reversible. Uh, but if you notice, my doses, while you might call me a pansy, are effective and uh, they're low. So low doses to obtain my objective. So usually just enough to take the edge off. For anesthesia, I really care less about uh, what you give and more about how you give it and what you're going to do once you give it. So are you going to be providing oxygen? If you're inducing anesthesia, then I'd love to see the patient intubated. Um, I want them to have IV access. I, you know, patent IV access and intubation, there's a reason CPR survive when they, when a cardiac arrest happens under anesthesia at a much higher incident than when they arrest in their cage in the ICU. And it's because we have everything in place to be successful. We have IV access, we have intensive monitoring usually already on board, we have oxygen already in the body um, and, and obviously giving it, and we're ready to go uh, with, with drugs quickly. So position yourself for success. Give yourself all the monitoring. If you have to choose drugs, try to choose drugs in a critical patient that are short acting and reversible and you'll find yourself to be much more successful. So wounds and lacerations, obviously hit by car, unknown traumas, uh, BDLDs, so big dog, little dogs, dog on cat, cat on cat. Cats can be really vicious. Um, this was an alligator on do dog image at LSU. It happens, they grab and they twist and rip and you get these like just sheared off wounds that then get really nasty and infected and obviously um, it's not good for the dog. So 
the leg was amputated by alligator and we were cleaning it up. So that patient was painful. Um, sedation is not always safer. Um, if you are monitoring and your patient is breathing well and you're giving oxygen, it might be maybe as safe as anesthesia, but if it's really hard to convince me that it's going to be breathing as well as it would if it was intubated um, and protecting that airway. So don't think, oh, I'm just going to sedate it and that will be safer. It's not always safer. Um, of course, no matter what we're doing, we're monitoring at least heart rate, respiratory rate, body temperature, um, and blood pressure. Uh, SpO2 monitor is helpful as well, but I have my feelings about them. Uh, but if you have nothing else, please use an SpO2 monitor. Uh, IV access, it's, to me, it's no longer a question. Should we have IV access? It, it is a necessity. Um, and I, I don't, if a client is coming and paying for my, for my services or services of the hospital that I represent, then IV access is just a fundamental that we're gonna have there. Um, it's for their safety, it's for my safety, um, and we're just gonna have it. There are some benefits of general anesthesia. So you have a patient, a patent airway, meaning you're intubated and you know you are, and the patient can't aspirate stomach contents, things like that. Um, you know you can give oxygen, and if you need it, isoflurane or sevoflurane, so an inhalant anesthetic. Um, Obviously the patient, and if you're doing your job well, is unconscious and there wouldn't be any movement. So your surgeon or your doctor can really focus on getting the job done in a timely, efficient manner. And um, you can monitor that patient effectively during that time and know that you're getting oxygen. So again, sedation, um, anesthesia or sedation, I have strong feelings about. I tend to gravitate more towards anesthesia if it's invasive um, than sedation because I, I just, it's not safer. Um, so, Whichever you choose, go for it, but always analgesia. So an opioid if it's, if it's a painful patient. So I have there hydro if, if you need it. I, I tend to gravitate towards methadone, which I realize is a little more expensive, um, and or fentanyl if I'm, if I'm giving a, a CRI. So here's our pillars of analgesia. Every time I'm asked to sedate or anesthetize a painful patient, I'm thinking of these four things. Opioids, I am an opioid generation. I can, I can do without them. I've learned how to deal without them. Obviously, we all have the last couple of years, and I've learned to minimize their use, but um, opioids are probably going to play a part in my analgesia addressing this patient's pain. Um, local block, if there's a local block to be done, no question asked, it's going to be done. And that's going to take care of quite a bit of, it's going to hold up the roof, basically, to this house. If NSAIDs aren't contraindicated, I really like an NSAID uh, on board before or after. If you can guarantee you're not gonna have hypotension, I'm fine before, but if you think you're gonna have hypotension, I'd wait till after. Uh, it, they really help with inflammation and the hypotension just can really augment an acute renal injury um, after surgery. So we just try to avoid NSAIDs, hypotension equals unhappy kidneys. And then adjunctive drugs. This is your lidocaine CRIs, your ketamine CRIs, maybe some dexmedetomidine in your pre-med. These are drugs that have analgesic properties, but maybe not sufficient ones on their own. Um, so I think, how, what else should I be doing? Should I be combining anything? And if I have something that falls into, let's say two to three of those categories, I feel like I'm doing a pretty decent job. I'd like to hit every one of them, but obviously there are going to be some situations where you just can't. So here's some suggestions on um, different drugs that I would use in different situations. Uh, for CRIs, I have loading doses. LD means loading dose. CRI obviously means a concentrated infusion. Don't tell me if you don't have a syringe pump, you can't do a CRI. I give a lecture about every other year through IndyVet on CRI calculations in a fluid bag. Happy to revisit that at some point. I don't know if I threw it in this lecture. Uh, but if you have fluid bags in your hospital, you can do CRIs. Um, so if it's needed, by all means, um, give it. Ketamine at low doses, I do consider using. While a hit by car, I wouldn't maybe induce with ketamine, but giving uh, these low doses for analgesic benefit, uh, specific analgesia is listed as the first point on both ketamine and lidocaine there. Um, that's where I gravitate towards. If, if large wounds, degloving, broken bones, burns, I think ketamine. Uh, lidocaine, I think more neuropathic or abdominal style pains, I'll gravitate towards that. Those are dog doses for the lidocaine. I, cats, I just 
don't usually use CRIs in cats until I've exhausted all other options for lidocaine uh, because they do have some toxic, um, they, they have a lower threshold for reaching that toxic uh, dose. And additionally, with isofluorine, they really cause vasodilation and it just tends not to be uh, friendly to the heart. Um, you can use dexmedetomidine as a CRI. I'm actually a really big fan of dexmedetomidine in critical patients. Um, I know the criticalist isn't on here listening to me. No, I don't know that she would disagree, but I know she's giving her own lectures. Uh, but I actually am a big fan. I just use pretty low doses to accomplish what I want. Um, even like septic abdomens, I'll throw really low doses in uh, for them. So. If I'm struggling, I think it, it really gets the inhalant off the patient and I can do a lot with, with these drugs. Um, and then opioids, there's, you know, obviously the, the, one of the primary pillars of analgesia is opioids and you can use those um, at various doses. The CRI dose there that I have listed is specific to fentanyl, uh, but you can run CRIs of hydro and uh, morphine and um, methadone. So, Moving on to respiratory distress and airway examination. These are some common diseases that you might find are coming into as primary causes for your respiratory distress. In general, I'm gonna treat them very similarly in many ways. Um, the heart disease patient may be a little different, but uh, the rest of them, if, if they're in distress and working themselves up, my goal is gonna be trying to reduce their stress. And I can do that first by potentially providing them oxygen, although we all know some patients, even though they know they need it, they refuse to sit there for it. Um, and sometimes it's the masks. So you can get creative with that. Um, I try to find the lowest stress, meth stress method of administering oxygen. So just flow by, I realize it's not gonna do a lot of great things there, but just if, if I can, get some oxygen to them, um, I, I feel better about it, even if it's just treating my feelings and not necessarily improving their um, actual inspired oxygen concentration. But butorphanol is really a champion here. It was first licensed in human medicine as an antitussive, so it will help uh, cause mild sedation and um, some resp it will help you if your patient's having respiratory distress. I have some doses there for you. Just keep in mind that its duration is fairly short from an analgesic standpoint. Um, an antitussive standpoint, I feel it doesn't last much more than two hours, but uh, for whatever reason, people do dose it at longer intervals. ACE promazine, this is where everybody's like, they either love ACE or you hate ACE. I'm telling you for respiratory distress, it is your friend. Even if this patient has liver disease, even if the patient is older, uh, even in most of the cardiac diseases that would cause respiratory distress, a really low dose that like five mics per kilo, that 0 0.005 um, will just take the edge off and keep them from dying that immediate respiratory distress death and allow you to mitigate other things. Very low doses uh, can take the edge off. It does have a longer duration and unfortunately it is not reversible. Um, and keep in mind it's not an analgesic in any way, but I usually do reach for low doses of acepromazine. Um, obviously if it's a respiratory distress secondary to congestive heart failure, obviously try your Lasix first, but, um, but these drugs are what I tend to reach for for that. Some other things I do if I have to do an airway exam is I definitely find a way to up their levels of inspired oxygen, so pre-oxygenation. Um, keep in mind that if you're doing flow by oxygen or oxygen by mask or shoving them into an oxygen cage or some, some box that you then hyper-oxygenate the box, um, keep in mind lubrication of the eyes. That can be very stressful, so I do try to find ways to reduce uh, anxiety, and, and one way to do that is generally by sedating them, um, but trying to minimize that sedation to a point where you're causing respiratory depression. So that, you know, obviously is a fine line there and a balance. Um, I do try to avoid vomiting. So you can see there I have morphine and hydro. I do personally try to avoid. I don't like the panting that hydro causes in a lot of dogs. Um, morphine will do it as well. And then obviously I'm trying to avoid vomiting. They already can't breathe. The last thing you want to do is be puking and trying to breathe. Uh, terrible. In cats, I do try to avoid dexmedetomidine because of the vomiting. If I feel like I just really need the dexmed in a cat because I need to, I don't know, get a radiograph or something, then I try to give Serenia some Meropitant first. 
And I just the basic line is just give everybody Serenia. I don't work for uh, what is it? Uh, Zoetis is it Zoetis? But uh, well, Pfizer's on the bottle there, but um, it's an old bottle that I pulled off the internet. But I hope they give me a kickback for selling Serenia to everyone. So here's here's how you're successful in saving respiratory distress lives. You're not scared to do a tracheostomy, which I know is absolutely terrifying. Um, but don't be scared. Uh, they're dying anyways, and don't be scared to intubate. Obviously, try intubation first. You know, be prepared with an IV catheter. Be prepared to just completely induce them. I do prefer drugs that are given to effects, and which is on the next slide. Um, and always be prepared to aggressively administer oxygen. So 100% oxygen nearby. Um, and, and tracheostomy, yeah, that's that's a a refined skill. But if I have an upper airway obstruction, I might just take like a really large gauge catheter and shove it between the tracheal rings and give oxygen that way. Um, get creative about how to get oxygen past that obstruction and be bold about it. If you wait too long, it's gonna be too late in those patients. Um, so anesthesia versus sedated airway exam. I am very comfortable with anesthesia, so I just like to induce it. Um, I'm pretty confident in being able to get something into the airway in some manner. Um, so I like alfaxone or propofol. In airway exams, there are publications that show patients who are pre-medicated actually were, had better respiratory excursions. So there's this big push. It's an old, older st stylistic means to airway exams where they just no pre-meds because I don't want it to affect its ability to take breaths and see the laryngeal function. But the drugs that really cause laryngeal relaxation and respiratory depression are the two that are on your screen there on the left. And they found that patients that were induced with straight Alfax, straight pro or straight pro propofol um, versus patients that were pre-medded and the drugs in the study were ACE and butorphanol and then induced with Alfax or propofol actually had better respiratory excursions and better glottic movement and um, uh, movement to their um, arytenoids than patients who didn't receive pre-meds because, oh my gosh, they use less induction drug. So that's what we're trying to accomplish there. Enough to keep the surgeon from being bit, but one that's still breathing. I'm not a fan of atropine. Um, or doxapram, it's a CNS stimulant. It increases uh, myocardial oxygen requirement. It does tease the brain with a little hypoxemia to cause them to want to breathe more to in and it increases heart rate. It's, it's an ugly drug. If I don't need it, I don't want to use it. I know that a lot of people like it because it makes the patient take nice big breaths, but at the consequence of um, hypoxemia. So i just not the biggest, biggest fan of doxapram, but uh, especially in neonates, never. I, I like doxapram in the trash, I'll be honest with you. That's the nice circular uh, receptacle called the waste bin is where I like to see it. But if you're going to use it, make sure you have oxygen available and please just at least pre-oxygenate your patient. Faster heart rates don't always mean better heart rates. You're really causing them to use a lot more oxygen when you speed up the heart rate. So if I don't need it, I'm not gonna use either of those drugs that do that. Urinary obstruction. We're just plowing right through, this is good. Okay, so you all have seen the cat comes in, it has an abdominal, you know, firm bladder, it's painful. Some are vocalizing, some are like laterally cumbent, which is absolutely terrifying. Obviously this is not just cats, dogs can have urinary obstructions as well. Um, and usually if there's a urinary obstruction and, it, and let's be honest, it's usually the male neutered overweight cat. Um, I have three of them in my house, well two. One I think has a thyroid problem or something that I haven't gotten worked up uh, and he's skinny. but. The other two are fat, um, so I'll be one of the pet owners that doesn't take care of their cat appropriately and, and rushes it in for an obstruction at some point. Um, but our goal here is to really unobstruct that bladder and stabilize them sufficiently to be able to do that. So analgesia, unobstruct bladder, and really control that serum potassium. So as you're obstructed, your potassium really spikes, and that can be life-threatening. Generally speaking, now we've had a cat recently that had a really high potassium and didn't like to play by the rules because cats are, you know, cats. But generally speaking, if as you see potassium increase, you get some characteristic changes to your ECG. I don't think it replaces just doing a quick uh, electrolyte on your chemistry, biochemistry panel, but um, 
if it's really truly urgent and you, you know you're, you're trying to get a ballpark idea of where this potassium is and how aggressive you need to be with treating it um, this is kind of in order from top to bottom what you start to see when you have hyperkalemia uh, so bradyarrhythmias and then Talton to T waves is pretty classic. Uh, of course, position of the electrodes on your patient for the ECG can cause some weird T wave appearances. Um, and we probably don't have calipers out measuring, but Talton to T waves, prolonged PR intervals. Then you tend to get absent P waves, those wide bizarre at the bottom of your screen, terrifying QRS complexes. Um, and I've caught, I've caught some really cool cat ones in that. Um, in that here uh, that have come in on emergency. And then eventually you see a Sicily um, or you can't see a Sicily. So very, very bad things. So our goal is gonna be trying to get that potassium down as quickly as possible, which does involve unobstructing the bladder and frequently involves sedation or analgesia. But the hyperkalemia, you know you're gonna unobstruct it one way or the other. You're either gonna put a urinary catheter in or you're gonna go to surgery if you can. So. With that in mind, I focus on number two first, diurese, 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 drop that potassium as quickly as, well, you know, I, I, I try to drop that serum potassium as quickly as I can. So starting with a 10 mil per kilo crystalloid bolus, followed by at least twice, twice maintenance, so anesthetic maintenance five mils per kg per hour, uh, plus or minus going from there. Um, you can give some cardiac protective drugs like calcium gluconate, you can give tributylene or albuterol, Tributylene I put in there because it's injectable, so I like the fact that I know it gets there. Albuterol, you need a little diffusion chamber and try to get it on the cat, little puffs, and, or dog, or for that matter. Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of just, I give them dextrose bolus, um, which causes the pancreas to release insulin and shove potassium back in the cells. So I tend to go for fluids and dextrose because that's quick and easy. Uh, insulin makes me nervous, so I just have to consult on, um, obviously I'm gonna cause a transient hyperglycemia. Um, but the, the, hopefully the pancreas can, res, can respond. And if not, I'll monitor that and give insulin if needed. Um, and then tributylene and albuterol are, are my friend as far as ease of administration. Calcium gluconate, I tend not to reach for quickly. I, I, I'm pretty good about getting the potassium down in other ways. Obviously, then I'm gonna sedate and unobstruct the bladder. So what would I sedate with? You know, I don't know that there's a best option. Um, I do like to give an opioid of some sort. So buprenorphine, I'm okay with, I like it, because I'm gonna do a local block and I don't have to worry about overriding it. But if you're not gonna be doing a local block of any kind in this urinary obstruction plus or minus surgery patient, then um, I think you need to stick with a full agonist. So methadone, hydromorphone, or a fentanyl CRI. Uh, morphine you could give if that's what you have. Um, it can cause some bradycardia and your patient might already be bradycardic. Dexmedetonine, I'm not, I don't have a problem giving low doses. In some of those weird arrhythmias though, I would kind of veer away from, from you know, potentiating the bradyarrhythmia. But if I needed it to sedate the animal, to get it unblocked, I probably would do so um, with, with it. Um, and of course, monitoring. I do like uh, benzodiazepines, but not in real excitable patients. Um, there is some support that they're gonna cause some urethral sphincter relaxation. So maybe that will help you unblock this animal. Um, but unfortunately, in a lot of our patients, if they're rowdy, they're gonna basically hover a magnifying glass over that patient's personality. So if it's a rowdy patient, it has the risk of making them more rowdy. If they're really high potassium, they probably aren't gonna be very rowdy and you're gonna be safe to use those if, if you'd like to use that in combination with an opioid over your alpha-2. I am an Alfax or propofol person, um, give to effect. Uh, I like that for unobstructing patients. I like to have oxygen handy. I don't always intubate these cats, um, but uh, in dogs, you tend to intubate more of them. Um, and then uh, obviously there are some advantages, alfaxalone versus propofol. Uh, I would probably lean towards more alfaxalone sedation in the fractious cat than a heavy dose of Dexmed. Um, Dexmed will also cause diuresis, all alpha twos do. So if you can't get it unblocked, you might be complicating uh, yourself to a point of potentially a ruptured bladder before you get in there to surgery. So I would tend to give the alfax and intramuscularly with my medications if I really had a fractious cat that I need to unblock, but that's just me. Um, here's your cock block in the cat. That's fun to say. Two C's though, C-O-C-C. -C. 
Um, I got some volumes there for you, some drugs listed that I've used um, at those volumes in cats or dogs for that matter. Um, so that's the sacral coccygeal or C coccygeal one to coccygeal two vertebrae. You can place it in there. Um, I use just a regular needle. You can use a spinal needle if you have them. Um, if I'm doing an epidural, I do tend to use a spinal needle uh, and those would work well as, as well for these. And I have some uh, drug options there for you. Like I said, happy to share the slides. So don't, don't panic. So moving on to enucleations, I'm sure we're doing fine here with questions, or I will interrupt. Um, enucleations, the things I keep in mind here is that, you know, there's no reason a GP shouldn't be able to do an enucleation. You have an enucleation come in on emergency or, you know, an ER, you don't necessarily need an ophthalmologist to do that. Yeah, they, they are very thorough and good at doing them, but um, ER docs, uh, this is something that is a very routine procedure for an ER doctor to do. Um, things to keep in mind, the big three, um, that these are painful. You can pull on that optic nerve and cause what we call a vagal reflex, whether that's uh, tremendously accurate in its terminology is, is up for dispute, but um, so a sudden drop in heart rate, if you pull on the nerve there, that optic nerve, um, and hemorrhage is actually, there could be significant hemorrhage if, um, if not controlled. So those are the three things that I really put in the back of my mind that I need to be prepared for as the anesthetist or the person sedating the patient. I would strongly prefer general anesthesia for these, but I know that there are ER doctors who do them under sedation. Um, it, one, my rationale is, is that if it's due to trauma, so in a, in a nucleation situation where I'm not worried about cancer or spreading a severe uh, infection, but it, it would have to be terribly severe, um, I will be doing a retrobulbar block. Again, like anytime I can do a local block, it's going to be done. Um, I think it's the best means of analgesia that we can provide ourselves and our patients, so I'm going to do it. So. I'm not sticking a needle, a curved needle behind the eye in a sedated patient. I'm just not gonna do it. I'm not comfortable. So for me, general anesthesia is the way to go, but there are plenty of people that have great success with just sedation. Uh, is to each their own there, but I would strongly recommend general anesthesia. Again, you need to be prepare, prepared for that ocular cardio, uh, cardio reflex or what people term the vagal reflex. Um, so that's a sudden drop in heart rate and you need to be prepared to generally with atropine around. Uh, I do include an opioid in my pre-medication. Of course, I give the um, retrobulbar block, avoiding that in patients where cancer is suspicious and a severe infection. I really encourage Noceta, if you have it, to use it in every closure um, that you can. Uh, and, and we do that here when we have it. Um, and then I would give an NSAID if I had no contraindications in that patient to giving an NSAID. Obviously at ICI, things like, you know, well, the absent eye, once it's done. Um, the hemorrhage can be very annoying because it's a, once the artery there bleeds, it sucks back into that socket and it's really hard to get to and basically just put a lot of digital pressure. Um, it's very hard uh, to, to get control of that and, and that can be very frustrating. They can lose a lot of blood. So what do we do for challenging patients? Well, the great news is we really have a lot of drug options uh, for challenging patients. If you notice, boxing down a cat is not one of them. So that's intentional. I don't do it. You're going to kill more patients than you're going to help. I can guarantee that if that cat is in a carrier or soft or hard, I can get a drug injection into it. And if you can't, and it's hissing at you like that cat, now it's not my preferred technique and it does look a little ugly and it's a little rude because it tastes really bad, but I can throw ketamine in that cat's face on the end of a catheter. So like take that sharp object out, the stylet, put a little catheter on a syringe and bam, when it hisses at you, Tomcat catheter works great, squirt it right in the face. Um, it's gonna be an ugly sedation, but it can be done. Um, normally, I don't have an issue getting an IM injection in the cat. If it's a hard carrier, anybody used to watch Wile E. Coyote, and the coyote is running with the run, road runner, and the road runner like runs, and they're off the cliff, and the coyote falls, what does he land on? A cactus, a cactus needle. So that fractious cat, I just make sure the door of the hard uh, 
carrier is on tightly. I have my little drugs it, with the needle right there, like the cactus, waiting for Wiley to fall off the cliff, sitting there. And when we flip the cat in its carrier, bore down to give it a little shake and it falls to the bottom, boom, into the cat. I see, enter cat. So Wiley, coyote, bing, done. Cat will go down. I usually go big or go home, so I use a little bit higher doses, make it happen, one hit, get the cat down. Um, it's not as safe for the patient, as far as the cardiovascular and hemodynamic changes that we'll probably cause with the drugs we have, but it's better than stressing that cat out, um, or dog for that matter, and it's better than getting bit um, and having to then explain to the owner, oh, you don't wanna fix this issue? Now we have to euthanize your patient and cut its head off because it bit one of our staff. Um, so I just tend to, to make it worth my while. So what drugs do I use? I am a big fan of Alfaxalone with Dexmed plus an opioid of some sort if I think the patient's painful. If I don't think it's painful, I usually do add butorphanol in there for the added, um, added sedation. Um, I will go 10 to 15 mics per kilo if I have to. I tend to stay around the 7 to 10 mark. The Alfaxalone, I usually do 2 to 3 mics per kg with that and uh, with a butorphanol take a dose um, of butorphanol and whatever fits reasonably in my syringe. It will be a larger volume than you're used to with ketamine intramuscularly, but it doesn't burn or sting. So it'll just kind of go in at usually about a mil in a cat, a, you know, average four kilo cat is the volume. And, and it, it goes real easily. They will go down in four to 10 minutes. If they don't, redose and don't wait much longer than 12 minutes. You're going to miss the advantages of the first dose. Um, when I redose, I usually cut my alfax in half unless the cat really has no effect and then I might dose again. Dogs, the Alfax intramuscularly just doesn't tend to work as well. One, it's a little bit larger volume because obviously dogs can be bigger than cats. Small dogs, it might work, um, but I, I, I tend to not use it intramuscularly in dogs. Um, you can use ketamine intramuscularly. If I have a really fractious dog, some of you on the other line are gonna probably crunch, but I use telazole. And I can make a mixture with a ketamine in there, but if it's really gonna take me out, trying to take me out, dexmedetomidine with, uh, with a dissociative anesthetic, that can bring one down, at least to be safe. I might start with Dextor, but if it's really coming through the wall at me, like what it looks like that Belgian Malinois is doing on our screen, um, I'm probably gonna make it worth my while and be as safe as possible. So here's some drug combinations that you can jot down if you want, or again, happy to share um, slides with you. Um, I obviously would just need an email address or something like that. Um, and then some drug suggestions as a one hit wonder for a sick cat. And since I already kind of walked you through those, I'm not gonna bother repeating it. And then here's some for a sick dog, um, or healthy dog and sick dog. So some, some drug options that, that I might, might do. Um, I'm probably gonna do more low dose dex meds and uh, opioids or opioid benzos in my sick patients, but Alfax isn't off the table. And so there's some and ors in there and choices for you. Last but not least, and we'll see if this works. It's supposed to be a hyperlink to show you. Abdominal pain, um, obviously we have our opioids. I think Serenia, so Serenia is an anti-vomiting drug. A lot of people will be like, oh, it's nauseous, give it Serenia. You know, it just really hasn't been shown to change the outcome of nauseousness. That's not to say that it makes you feel less nauseous because you're not vomiting. So maybe you mitigate the vomiting and the patient looks less nauseous. That's probably a good thing, but it's really not an anti-nausea. It's, it's an, you know, it's a anti-vomiting, anti-emetic uh, drug. Um, whether or not it has analgesic properties, I feel like if you're not vomiting when you have abdominal pain, that's got to help out some, you know, uh, as it's just extremely miserable to be vomiting when you have abdominal pain. I do tend in dogs to gravitate pretty quickly to lidocaine. Um, I would prefer that, honestly, over a fentanyl CRI. Um, I would say that's not probably the norm. A lot of people do gravitate towards fentanyl, but you got this patient, it's already probably nauseous, plus or minus vomiting, and you're gonna add a drug that causes nausea, and then you're gonna be mad that it doesn't eat. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, there, <laughs> there you go. Um, so if I can do something other than that, great. 
With that being said, there's nothing more potent than fentanyl as far as controlling pain. So if the patient's painful, sometimes you just don't have a choice. I like to try to lidocaine CRI with Buprinex or methadone um, and see if I can cut, cut that um, before throwing them on a fentanyl CRI, but fentanyl we tend to gravitate towards because it's easy. It's just what people are used to making up, I think, more than anything. I don't know that this is going to connect, but I was going to show you the novel. Oh, it's not going to work because I'm not logged in, but I can, if I can log in quickly, navigate away here, I can show you that um, when we close this out. We're doing tap blocks, which is, again, like I said, if there's a local block to do, we should do it. So in a patient that's really painful, maybe a pancreatitis patient that we're trying to get to eat, so we wanna get off all these drugs because lidocaine can cause some nausea too, um, tap block is where it's at. Uh, it will help you, um, but it does take quite a bit of skill to place as far as you gotta be really good with an ultrasound and be able to identify different abdominal planes there, or uh, muscular planes, fascial planes. So uh, it, is, it is something, we use Noceta in it, uh, diluted pretty pretty it's a one to four one to five dilution with saline and that gives us three days of pain relief so a lot of these patients will be eating um, and they can go home and we've we've given them three days of pain relief uh, with that technique so if you're interested i will play that here as our final takeaway because i will have to drop the powerpoint and share with you um, uh, a different screen so final takeaways that i'd like to really you know, drive home is that sedation is not always safer than anesthesia. While it is cheaper, uh, often it is not always without sacrificing safety. So keep in mind that regardless of what choice you make, whether you're going to sedate something or anesthetize them, please monitor every patient. I feel that IV access is an absolute requirement, um, at least here in this in this hospital uh, at any vet, um, the standard of care we like to provide it is a requirement. Um, we provide oxygen and have access, if, if you're not intubated, at least have the ability to do so. So have all your supplies ready and available and the confidence and competence to do so. And then um, always, always, always provide adequate analgesia. Keeping in mind adequate analgesia is not the same across species and is not, across, not the same across individuals within a species. So um, Adequate analgesia is also not a single dose, generally, uh, and it's not always a single drug. So it is a modality that we provide and it requires continual reassessment. Um, so those are my final takeaways. I have six minutes to answer your questions. And as Mariah will read them, I will open up and show you the short video of how to do a tap block. Um, any questions? Uh, all right. Right. One question is, what about hypothermia in cats with hydro? So yeah, it, the reality is all opioids can cause it. Um, it's the excitation. Yes, hydro tends to do it more. Um, if hydro was the only opioid I have and my cat was painful, I would use it. Um, the hypothermia in cats tends to be worse when they get really cold. So I would definitely try to uh, monitor their body temperature. And uh, sorry, I'm having to log in. Um, so I would, you know, no, it's a risk. Does it happen in every cat? No. Does it happen frequently in cats? Probably. Um, it's going to happen worse in cats that get cold. So try to keep them from getting cold. Try to keep them from getting stressed. And if it's the only drug that I have that's a potent analgesic and I need it, I'm going to use it. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Um, if you have another option, there's nothing wrong with being like, well, I have, so I have methadone here. I would use methadone before I used hydro for that reason. But if I didn't, I would, uh, I would still use hydro if my cat was painful. I've given hydro to many cats. They don't die. They might get a little warm. You can sing that hot blooded in the back of your, uh, no. It's sad because I can't see everybody laughing, but hopefully there were some laughs there. Um, any other questions? Nope, that was it. Long. If anybody has any, please just use the Q&A. I am going to drag over, sorry. You're looking at Mariah's screen. Where is it? Oh, maybe it's the other way. There it is. So this is a tap block. This is a block that we did here at IndyVet. Um, and 
poor Dr. Gillespie realizes anytime we do anything, I'm like, oh, give me my phone. Wait, don't move. I need to look. Um, and it feels like it's going painfully slow and it might run off. So feel free if you want to jump out. But this is something that we are capable of doing here. It does require sedation or anesthesia. So if we have a patient, um, it works great for like C-sections, abdominal procedures, um, and things that might be really painful, septic abdomens. Um, and this dog had pancreatitis. So it provided three days of analgesia. It got his feeding tube out. He could eat um, he, he was willing to eat because he wasn't nauseous, and it allowed us to drop off all of his fentanyl serized uh, to get him to eat. And so you can see, though, it does take quite a bit of skill in, in realizing these fascial planes and injecting that local anesthetic. So that needle's coming up. Where's my where's the mouse? Oh, I have no mouse. The needle's coming in here. That's the needle. And... Um, we're going to deposit the local anesthetic here and you can see it separating that fascial plane. Um, so black is liquid. And so the local anesthetic solution there, we use no seed and saline. It's just going to slowly absorb um, over three days and provide analgesia. You do have to do it bilaterally. So sorry, I had two screens. So I'm looking at the screen to see what you're seeing. Um, so, you know, it, it, it isn't intimidating. I can't do it by myself, I'll be honest. I can work the syringe and do the drug doses, but I need someone who works an ultrasound uh, to be able to do it. But it is pretty profound, um, the, uh, the difference in the patients uh, that we get the opportunity to do that for. So again, if there's a local block, that's what we do, if it's possible. You can watch this video if you go uh, to thinkanesthesia.education. It's stuff that I create for a pharmaceutical company and you can learn things, lots of learning. Um, but that's where that video is if you wanted to find it. Excellent. Well, you can always email me. Ah, where's my mouse? Other way. Um, you can always email me questions as well and if anybody wanted shared stuff. I wonder if I type in the Q&A, will everybody see it? Can I, I can't type it. Um, I was gonna say, if I could just put up my um, email address. Um, and let me just, so if you look in the chat on your Zoom, you'll see my email address. If you want some of these uh, lecture slides or content, I'm happy to happy to share that. Excellent. Well, that's it, I guess. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. On a, yep, thanks. Farewell. Happy anesthesia.